um, and another woman who was had CDs at the local bank, and I think Citibank was their correspondent, so we figured um, Citibank was getting their money at about 3 or 4%, and then one of their close friends was borrowing money on her Citibank credit card for 24%. So, so here you have three women in Tennessee who are being arbitraged as, as what we used to call on Wall Street a 2,000 basis point spread. The so Citibank's getting the money at 4% and lending it out to their best friend at 24%. Well, it doesn't, you know, if they just talk to each other and re-engineer it among themselves or with the help of a local bank, they could make a fortune by cutting Citibank out. And that's disintermediation. And so it's whether it's doing more for yourself or... Um, or finding those opportunities to cut cut out the big guys, um, the economics are changing. I always tell the story of a client who was complaining that her water bill was going up and the yields on her portfolio were going down. And I said, it's very simple. Sell your stock and build a well. That's an example of disintermediation. And more and more of those opportunities are going to pop up in our balance sheets and income statements. We just have to be sensitive to it. So clearly that's one. And part of it is using your money to get bad guys out of your life. Um, because debasement is not just about the reduction of your savings or the value of your dollars. It's Debasement is something that's happening across your income statement and your balance sheet. So, for example, if you look at your utility bill, well, you know, let's say your utility bill has been going up 10% a year. What you don't understand is the quality of the, of the product has been going down. If you have a dirty electricity problem, if they're putting on a smart meter, you're basically, you may be paying for your for your utility bill with your life. Um, so the debasement is not just in the money, it's in the quality uh, of the products and services, and there's this invisible debasement that sometimes we don't see. Okay, so, so one is disintermediate, do more for ourselves, invest money in, in building up our own infrastructure. Two is obviously, you know, I'm I'm a great believer in precious metals for this period of time. We're going through a fundamental shift between paper assets and real things. And for most people, precious metals is relatively simple, relatively liquid, and it's absolutely something we can all do. Um, a third thing is uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you are an entrepreneur, building up a source of skills and enterprise that can help you generate an income in this environment is absolutely invaluable. So everybody needs income, everybody needs the ability to be useful in building those skills and, um, and, and creating enterprises that can generate income is very, very important. I sort of call that you Inc. Um, and that includes doing whatever you have to do to make sure you're healthy. One of the things I find with many of my clients is they underspend on the quality of food and health, not realizing, you know, I said before, I'm worried that they can confiscate your body. But if you're, if you're very clever about maintaining your health and high-quality food and spending whatever money you have, you then have a clear mind and a healthy body which can generate income and generate barter under the worst circumstances, whereas if you don't have that, you know, it's much harder for them to, to confiscate your your mind and your body than it is your 401k. So so just remember to invest in you, Inc. And then finally, I do continue to be um, uh, help people invest in securities because I, I think we put all of our money in gold and silver and put it in a vault and look at it, the world really will collapse because the thing that keeps the the world operating is enterprises that do useful things. So I think there's um, uh, an explosion of healthy development around the globe. We are rebalancing the global economy. There are many aspects of that that can be positive. And so I think there's an awful lot of opportunity to invest in in enterprises in the growing markets, um, particularly where the culture is healthy or uh, particularly where you have a younger population. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of equity uh, opportunity as well. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's a simple thing. Um, it's a very different paradigm that most, uh, most people, certainly in the United States, have followed. But... Uh, 
you know, the, the shift to global is upon us, and it's not just happening because Mr. Global wants it. It's because people want it, too. Okay. Wow. Thank you very much for that answer, Catherine. Really do appreciate it. Um, some of the folks here would like to take a break, if that's okay with you. Uh-huh. Hi, this is McLaren. We're back, and we've been speaking with Catherine Austin Fitz. Please visit her website on the internet at www.solari.com. That's S O L A R I.com. It's all about building personal and family wealth in changing times. At this point, we want to talk to Catherine about precious metals, and for that next question, we'll ask Groundrod to lead it off. Yeah, Catherine, thanks for all those great answers. I think there's a lot of us around the world that want to stand hand in hand with Miss Local, and we've all had enough of Mr. Global. <laughs> <laughs> My first question is, are you aware of how much movement of gold is coming into the market out of Iran? Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. It, that wouldn't surprise me at all. But I don't, I don't know. And it's, it's like many other things where finding, getting information that you trust is near impossible. Right. I just wanted to know if there was anything on that and uh, how it would affect the PM market. Moving on, let's see, I had an inspiration one day and shared an article on the front page of our forum which speculates on how Silver could become more valuable than gold. Do you think that silver could become more valuable than gold? Or, well, I think the if you look historically, um, if you uh, if you look at the long sweep of history, what we see is we see cycles back and forth between uh, periods when paper assets are dominant and then period when tangibles are dominant, and then paper and then tangibles. And if you look back and I'm now referring to James Turk of Gold Money's analysis, um, what he shows is that, you you know, at, at the end of the long-term bull market intangibles, the gold-silver ratio is 15 to 1. Now, if that's the case, the gold-silver ratio today is a little bit over 40. Um, if the gold-silver ratio were to fall to 15 to 1 at the end of this shift, as, you know, assuming that history happens again, which it doesn't always, but... But if we just see the historical pattern, then we would expect silver to outperform gold over this time period. Um, and so, so I'm expecting from today to the end of the shift that silver will probably outperform gold because you'll probably, you know, see silver, see the gold-silver ratio fall from 43, I think it is right now, down to about 15. Now, um, if and when that happens one ounce of gold will still buy 15 ounces of silver. So could I see a world where one ounce of silver could buy 15 ounces of gold? Um, unlikely unless, you know, the technology that we sometimes hear whispered by, you know, people who've had a little too much to drink is, you know, oh, they can create gold out of lead or something. The technology exists. So, you know, without that kind of technology, I just don't see an ounce of silver being worth more than an ounce of gold. Well, my article goes to the idea of the basically people have had it with the banksters and central control folks that have tied up all the gold in very few places, or maybe that's not true, but 
I just don't know if you wanted to uh, trade me for the deer, uh, whether I'd care if it was a piece of gold or a piece of silver and can easily see one to one. With industrial demands continuing, I just see silver could potentially do better than gold, but that's just me. Well, I, I do think if we get to the point where gold and silver are being used as currency, that, um, you know, the divisibility of silver is going to is going to make it uh, is going to create demand for silver much more than gold in in some ways. So I do think that silver's divisibility could add tremendously to its value in some scenarios. And I would point out, if you haven't yet, we have um, uh, something called the gold silver payment calculator. If you come to my website and you link to it, it will convert back and forth between gold and silver and uh, and currency, fiat currency, about 20 different currencies. So you can convert back and forth between the the Kiwi dollar, the U.S. dollar, the Australian dollar, back and forth into gold and silver. Yeah, and, nice job um, on that, by the way. If you go, there's an equivalent page, and it lists all the sort of common bullion coins um, and prices them at melt value. We get a feed from gold money. And I was just meeting with Franklin Sanders. We just approved the iPhone app, which should be rolling out. I believe it's we're going to start marketing this week. But you should be able to download it. Um, and and basically, one of the reasons cool. we we want that is we want you know merchants and people to have on their handheld devices a way to toggle back and forth. It'll be free. So. Um, and, and we think that's one of the critical little tools that needs to be floating around if we're going to start transacting. Of course, here in the States, one of the other issues is getting the state treasurers and le- legislatures to agree not to try and charge sales tax when we use use it as a currency. So um, well, those are some of the steps. But I agree the divisibility of silver in certain scenarios could make it, could, could give us to the gold-silver ratio falling. Yeah, and love your interviews with Franklin. Thanks for those. Uh, I guess our next question is from Vito. Hi, Catherine. This is Vito. Hi. Hi. I realize we've already endured a 90% debasement in the U.S. dollar or Federal Reserve note, and I realize your perspective on the confiscation of our minds and our bodies and that why try to get filet mignon out of a mule. But assuming that things aren't that bad off, and at cost of being repetitive, why don't you think there will be eventual gold confiscation? Even after hyperinflation debasement, won't Mr. Global need gold for a new currency as opposed to the digital currency that you spoke of earlier? Do you really think that people will swallow the digital currency scheme? Oh, I, th- I, I think he'll want gold. And uh, now that, you know, gold can be digital too. You can have fiat gold. Um, but I think he'll want gold, and one of the one of the arguments for not confiscating is, um, you know, he, he's going to want some popular support to push for the gold. So right now there's a groundswell of people pushing for gold and the theory that it's what's good for the grassroots, but what they're pushing is what's good for Mr. Global. So um, so why confiscate? Uh, they they. You know, the amounts they have in the scheme of things are tiny, not to say that it wouldn't be useful to have them, but um, if if he wants, the, you know, on a theory that he's used fiat currency to steal everything, if he wants to shift back to sound currency with gold at the center of it, which is exactly where I think he wants to go, then why confiscate? Why not just have those people pushing to help get where he wants to go? If you, if you come to my blog tonight at salary.com slash blog, what you'll see is <laughs> we made a new cartoon of Mr. Global. Um, uh, and at the top of the blog, what it says is Mr. Global squeeze play, because it's quite nifty what he just did. He had Congress insist uh, on no taxes on corporations and no taxes on the wealthy, so he got to get 